Welcome to the official Pioneer Ferries deck tech. Let's directly start with talking about Renkel. Next to the Sleep Cursed Ferry, this might be the single most important creature in the deck. He is not only the reason why this deck plays 6 discard spells, he is also the reason why this deck runs a full playset of the Fairy Dream Thief. While presenting us with a fairy that has haste and flying, we mainly focus on the discard or sacrifice ability. This means most of the things we do in the early game are there to preparate a board state in which Rankle can shine and either force the opponent to sacrifice a creature each turn or to discard one of the left hand cards that are important. Our fairies use the adventure ability to take cover, so we don't have to discard our own fairies, but rather play them out of the exile later on. For his sacrifice ability, we mainly use the fairy dream thief, Muta Vaults and the Picklock Prankster. I find it necessary to mention that Rankle's second ability is mainly used for a final blow when there is one life point missing. We then can force the opponent to draw a card and lose one life. The last thing I want to mention about Rankle is not to always play him in turn 4, but to play him when the board state is ready. Well, I have already mentioned the Fairy Dream Thief, so Let's move there. The Fairy Dream Thief is not only there to provide us with a fairy in turn 1, so we can have Ego Drain, Spell Stutter and Fairy Fencing to be impactful, but he also provides us with a fairy that we can sacrifice or discard to Rankle without losing too much card advantage, because we can exile him from the graveyard to draw a card later on. He also pairs well with Picklock Prankster's ability Free the Fey, where we have to mill four cards. Of course his surveil ability is also really handy and helps us to filter our draws and make the deck even more consistent. I could best compare him to cards like Consider, but instead of another draw he provides us with a little fairy on the board, which can also be great just to chunk block so our sleep cost fairy has a little more time to wake up for example. Now so far I have mentioned two other fairies, the Steep Cursed Fairy and the Picklock Prankster. Before I move to the Picklock Prankster, I really want to talk about the Sleep Cursed Fairy. Because the printing of Sleep Cursed Fairy is one of the reasons why this deck is even playable. Her ward ability secures us a fairy in the first place, while her untap ability makes a great mana sink when we leave two mana open for spells like the Spell Stutter or Brassenborough's Pity Theft. When the opponent does nothing we have to handle, this is where we can untap the Sleep Cursed Fairy at the end of turn, so we are not going to lose the pace as a tempo deck, and this means we can always spend our mana somewhere. She does not only fit perfectly in the curve, this also means she is great in the late game, where we are able to attack with her and then untap her in the opponent's turn to use her as a blocker. Before I move to the Picklock Prankster, there's another fairy that I want to talk about. Brassenborough adds to our fleet of attackers what no other fairy can. His pity theft ability is not only a perfect fit for our mana curve, but he can also surprise our opponents in turn 3 as a 3-1 flying attacker, right before going into turn 4 and playing Rankle as another 3-3 attacker. This means we can surprise our opponents with 6 damage in turn 4. While most of the time he is played as an attacker in the early game, I find it important that his pity theft ability has the possibility to get rid of artifacts and enchantments together with Thoughtseize and Ego Drain. But most of the time his pity theft ability is used in the early game to handle an early threat, so he can already move to the adventure, so he is not to be discarded with Rankle. At this point I want to underline again that often the play pattern in which we release our fairies can be more important than playing on curve. With this important information out of the way, I finally want to move to the Picklock Prankster. We have talked about attackers, now let's talk about defenders. His Free the Fey ability is most often used in turn 2, where it's common to hold up mana for spell stutter. This is of course to prefer to untapping the Sleep Cursed Fairy. This also fits into the curve when we want to play Ego Drain or Fairy Fencing in turn 3, so we can play the Picklock Prankster out of the exile 
to get a ferry onto the board. But to be honest, this is most often not the best play pattern, because that means we didn't have a ferry in turn 1 or turn 2, and we had to find other ways to get a ferry onto the board. Most of the time this is the case with mediocre starting hands, but still this way he provides a way to make the deck more consistent. But now, let's move to the positive, to the reason why we play him four times in the deck. Once free the fey resolves, this provides us with another fairy in the exile for the late game, to sacrifice to Renke for example, without himself being part of the discard ability from Renke. Even if he just hits for one, this can often still be considered free damage, because he has vigilance. In my opinion, the best way to play him is to focus your full attention on playing reactively and using his Free the Fey ability to allow you to find situational cards like Fairy Fencing or Renke. Of course, this is especially true for sideboard cards. There is still one Fairy left in the deck we haven't yet really talked about. The Mutavolt. Mutavolt is not only there to sacrifice into Renke, but this is one of the necessary components to make the deck more consistent. While cards like Ego Drain and Fairy Fencing really need a fairy on the board to work, she can also buff Spell Stutter and can be used as a great way to attack opponents that have only Sorcery Speed Removal. She completes her role in the deck with being another creature without having to cast a creature, so that means she is part of the land count in the deck and some opponents can't handle that additional pressure in the late game, where most of the time we trade one for one but we try to trade 2 for 1 with Renke as much as possible. Now that I have talked about the fairies, let's go a step further and talk about the spells. While the wording of the card Fairy Fencing makes it one of the most reliable fairy spells there is, we still need to secure a fairy to the board to remove a creature. I want to compare this spell to the next best removal we play in this deck. Fatal Push. While only able to kill creatures up to CMC2, the spell was better situated in Modern, where the fairies had access to fetch lands. Now, with the additional benefit of being able to tap more mana into the spell, we have a better march of the wretched sorrow in our hands. With only paying 3 mana for the spell, it can get rid of a Shieldred, and I really appreciate that. The card Spell Stutter clearly resembles the old Spell Stutter sprite from Lorwyn. While not bringing a fairy to the board, we are now able to counter CMC3 spells in turn 2 or 3, which was before only possible with Mana League. So, combining these two cards makes it a great and worthy counter spell for the deck. Feared for being one of the most played cards, Thoughtseize is the best spell to compare to Ego Drain. Printed for the first time in Lorwyn, this has been a staple of the deck since then. In modern fairies, a split between Thoughtseize and Inquisition of Kozilek has been established. Now we play the same split but with Ego Drain instead of Inquisition of Kozilek. After all was said and done, I still had one slot in the deck left to fill. I've tried different creatures and spells and I ended up playing Shieldred. With the possibility to draw cards with Renke and the Dream Thief, she is just a perfect fit for the deck, and she adds another win condition that is often hard to handle for other opponents. Now that we have talked about all the fairies and Shieldred, it's time to move to the mana base, another really integral part of the deck. I have tried different constellations, but since Mutavolt doesn't generate colored mana, the options were very limited in the end. Brassen Borrower, as well as Renke and some sideboard cards, require multiple mana of the same color, which unfortunately doesn't allow us to be too playful with the mana base, to play something like Cavern of Souls or Field of Ruin for example. Instead, building the mana base around lands that can provide both colors of mana at the same time has proven to be a good idea. Alright, let's have a look at the mana base. I've ended up playing 4 Watery Grave, 4 Underground River, and four Dark Slick Shores. To have more options for multicolored lands, I additionally play two Clearwater Pathway slash Murkwater Pathway. After doing the math 
and because of the sideboard cards, I ended up playing only three basic lands, two swamp and one island. To bring the number of lands up to 23, two more man lands come into play, which I couldn't leave out because of their strength. Hive of the Eye Tyrant brings another additional way to interact with the opponent's graveyard into the deck, while Hall of the Storm Giants fulfills the role of another attacker for the endgame. So, let's wrap things up. In my opinion, this deck is all about making the right play patterns at the right time. Cards that trade 2 for 1 or bring other advantages like Adeline Resplendent Cathar or Born Crusher Giant for example have to be countered or discarded, while cards that are just there to protect or creatures that can be blocked with a 3-3 creature are to be either resolved and blocked or handled later on with removal. The Sleep Cursed Fairy plays right into this playstyle by becoming relevant around turn 4 to 5. I think the most important part is not to lose control over the board state of the opponent. This means that cards that can produce tokens have a big advantage against us, but so far I can only think of a few decks in Pioneer that assemble tokens and a few glistening deluge in the sideboard are a great way to handle those decks. I think fairies are really well positioned against combo decks, where we can get a good use out of all the discard and counter spells. The decks we have to think the most about are mid-range decks and aggro decks, but I think we still have a fair matchup against both. I would even consider control decks to be in a slight disadvantage because of the heavy discard package and all the counter spells the fairies are carrying. However, where fairies run into trouble are the decks that are really good at recycling their spells or decks that can handle flying creatures, for example monogreen midrange or phoenix decks. Control matchups are always fierce and hardly forgive mistakes, but are a lot of fun due to the amount of interaction the fairies bring with them. Alright, that would be the deck tech for fairies in Pioneer. I hope you have as much fun with the deck as I, and I wish you exciting and interesting games. As always, thanks for watching and have a nice day.